Hey everyone, you know what we'll be doing today? We were... Code player health and fall damage. Y you read the title. You already know. Anyway, let's just, let's just start. We'll be continuing from the last tutorial with an FPS controller already set up, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel again. Oh, and I forgot to mention in the last video, but in case you're wondering how to run your game in full screen, go to Project Settings, Window, and enable full screen from this option. Alright, in this video, we'll cover how to code the player health, add fall damage, and also discuss some important good concepts like tweens, autoloads, resources, switching scenes, and maybe more. Okay, let's have it up, player. Listen here, you little shit. You think you're better than me? No, you're bad. In, in fact, you know what? You, you're the. Oh! Here's how we're going to detect if the player should take fall damage. We'll keep track of the old velocity of the player along the Y axis on every update. Then, we'll calculate the difference between the current velocity and the old one and check if it's more than a given threshold. If it is, the player will take damage. Okay, let's implement that. I'll open up the player script and start with defining a variable to store the old velocity, which I'll set to zero. Then, at the end of the physics process function, after we've called move and slide, I'll define a variable div with its value set to velocity.y minus the old velocity. Then, I'll check if diff is more than 20 and print a message to the console to let us know that the player is hurt. It's important to set the value of the old velocity to the new velocity.y after we're done. Now, let's run the game using the F5 key and check if the player can detect fall damage. On jumping from a small ledge, nothing gets locked to the console. But, on jumping from the top, we get the message that the player detected the fall. Now, we can do a bunch of things to the player, but before that, let's define an export variable called fall damage threshold with a value 20 and update our fall condition to use this variable. This way, we can easily change the threshold from the inspector without opening the code. Bonus tip, you can organize your export variables into separate groups using the export group annotation. Now, all your exports will be present inside these collapsible groups. While goofing around setting the fall damage threshold to 1, I noticed that the player gets hurt twice when jumping. This is because the code detects damage twice. Once when going up from zero velocity, and then after falling to zero from negative velocity. This is easily fixed by adding a check to only damage when the old velocity is negative, that is, when the player is falling down. With that, the player will only hurt on hitting the floor and not when going up. Printing a message to the console doesn't feel that good. So, let's create some visual effects to show when taking damage. In the player scene, I'll add a texture rigged node and rename it to hurt overlay. Remember, you can only see the 2D nodes in the 2D view. To always keep the texture covering the screen, I'll set its anchor to full rect. Now, I made this simple texture in GIMP and exported it as a PNG. I'll put it inside the player folder and then load it as the texture for the hurt overlay node. If you want to use the same texture for your project, feel free to use mine. I'll post the link to the project in the description. Just note, you might have to copy and paste the link for the time being, since YouTube lock the feature to add links to my video descriptions to protect the community. Thanks YouTube for saving my viewers from learning game dev Anyway, here's what we're going to do. By default, the overlay would have transparent modulation, which would make it invisible. When the player is hurt, we'll animate the overlay modulation to go from full opaque back to transparent using a tween. Tweens are great for changing properties or values over time, and we'll learn how to use them in just a moment. Back in the player script, I'll create a reference to the hurt overlay by control dragging it from the scene hierarchy. Then, I'll define a variable to store the tween we'll use to animate the modulate property. Let's remove the print call and instead call a function hurt. I'll define the function at the bottom of the script, and inside the function, I'll set the modulate color of the hurt overlay to white. Then, I'll check if the tween is already present and kill it. After that, I'll create a new tween and store it in the hurt tween variable. And lastly, I'll call the tween property function of the tween passing the object whose property we want to change, the name of the property, the final value we want the property to be, and the time we want it to take to change. Now, if everything went well, you should see a painful overlay every time the player takes fall damage. Let's add some game juice to the effect. If you've been following the previous tutorial, you'll have this crouch function in your player script. After calling the hurt function, let's also call the crouch function. Even though it's subtle, every time the player takes fall damage, the player crouches ever so slightly, just like real life. With that, we're done with the fall damage code, although there's no real consequences for the player. Let's hurt him for real this time. I'll start with adding a progress bar node and rename it to health bar. With the node selected, I'll go to the inspector and set the show percentage to false 
and the value to 100. Then in layout, transform, I set the size to 550 and the anchors preset to bottom left. You can set it to whichever position you want it to be. Lastly, I'll go to the theme overrides, styles and set the background to a flat style box with the black color and the foreground to a flat style box with the red color. With that, I'll go to the player script and add a reference to the health bar. Then in the hurt function, I'll pass the parameter damage and decrease the value of the health bar by that damage. Up in the code where we call the hurt function, I'll pass the damage value. Now you can pass a fixed value if you want, but I want it to be a bit realistic. So I'll pass the amount of velocity that's extra after the threshold. This way falling from a relatively smaller height won't do as much damage as falling from a much higher height. Even if it seems like we've achieved the objective of this tutorial, we still have a couple more issues to fix. But before that, I need to code a quick scene switcher to demonstrate the issue. Let's create a new scene with an area 3D as a root node. I'll add a collision shape and set it to be a square. It doesn't matter what you set it to really. Next, I'll attach a script to it and from the inspector, I'll connect the body entered signal to the script. In the function, I'll check if the body is of the class player and call get tree then change scene to file, passing the path to a demo2 scene, which we'll create in just a minute. But before that, let's quickly hop over to the player script and at the top, define the class name to be player, so the area node detects it. Remember, there are better ways to handle scene switching, but that's out of the scope of this video. Here, I've created a very basic demo2 scene with a static body cube as a floor and an instance of the player scene. After that, I'll instantiate the scene switcher in both the demo scene as well as the demo2 so we can go back to the previous scene. But wait, the code for the scene switcher only goes to the demo2 scene. So instead of using this hardcoded value, I'll define an export variable to store the file path of a scene. Use it in the change scene call and set the path to demo2 in the demo scene and to demo in demo2 scene. I've tried to keep the scene switcher code very basic, but if it still doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry, we'll cover it in much depth in a future video. Now, walking into the switchers, they should switch to the other scene, kinda like a portal. But now we can see one major issue. Did you notice it? Here, let me do it one more time. See? Changing the scene resets the player health every time. The reason for that is that every time we call the change scene function, Godot discards the current scene and loads the one that we passed to it. This essentially means that every time we change scene, the player node is a fresh new node totally unrelated to the previous one condition supply. So it makes sense that the player health also goes back to the original. But that's not what we want. To keep data and states consistent across the whole game, Godot has a neat feature called an autoload, also known as a singleton. An autoload is basically a scene or just a script that runs separately to the main scene and remains in the tree regardless of which scene you are running. Now to solve our problem, we'll create an autoload script to store our game state and use it for keeping persistent info across the scenes. Okay, enough talk. Let's create a GD script and call it game state. In the script, all I need to do is create a variable state and add a health property to it. Then I'll go to project settings, auto load and load the game state script, set its name to game state and press the add button. Now the game state auto load should be accessible from every script throughout the project. Let's go to the player script and in the hurt function, after changing the value of the health bar, I'll set the game state dot state dot health to the health bar's value. When the new player is initialized, we need to set the health bar value to the one stored in the auto load. So I'll go to the ready function and set the health bar's value to the health value stored in the game state. With that, the player health remains the same after changing the scenes. The code works, sure, but you know, I prefer to follow good coding practices. So let's change up a few things. Setting the value of a variable of another object directly is bad practice. So back in the game state script, I'll define a get value function that takes a key, checks if the game state has the key and returns the value of the key. Otherwise it prints an error. I'll also define a set value function that simply, well, sets the value in the game state. Then I'll go to the player script and change the code to use the functions we just defined. In the ready function, I'll use the get value function to set the value of the health bar. And similarly in the hurt function, I'll use a set value function. Everything should be working the same now, however, we're using good code and that makes me happy. Now to demonstrate the other issue, I'll put the scene switcher inside the vent and crawl into it in game. Hmm, notice anything different? 
Let me get back to the previous scene. You see, the play seems to stick to the crouching position. If you're thinking maybe the crouching function is accidentally being called, or maybe the fall damage code is being triggered, you'll be wrong. This issue was a head scratcher for me. But the reason for this issue is quite trivial. In the player scene, the shape value we set in the collision shape is a resource. And Garot shares resources among nodes to save memory. So, before switching the scene, the player's collision shape has a crouch height as its size. And the second scene reuses the resource thinking the crouch height is its standing height in the ready function. So the second scene has the player standing normally. The code works fine. It's just that it thinks it's a short boy. The fix for this issue is to simply set the collision shape's shape resource to be local to scene. This makes sure the resource is unique for each instance of the node, or in our case, the player. With that, you should have a functional health bar and a fall damage mechanic to interact with it. It's not necessary, but I think the health bar can do with a small dose of game juice. So, let's duplicate the health bar node, rename it to health bar BG, and place it above the health bar node, so it draws behind it. I'll open up its theme overrides, and in the styles, I'll make the fill style box unique since it'll be shared with the original health bar if we don't. Then, I'll change its color to white. I'll also open up the original health bar, make its background unique, and turn off draw center. Just give me one more minute, it'll all make sense. In the code, I'll add a reference to the health bar BG and set its value in the ready function as well. Lastly, in the hurt function, right after starting the tween, I'll set the tween's ease and trance to these values and run another tween to animate the value of the health bar BG to go to the health bar value in 0.6 seconds. Make sure to run both the tweens in parallel. Run the game and oh ho ho ho, look at that juicy, juicy health bar. If you're a curious one, you'll notice that we wrote the code for hurting the player, sure, but we did not write anything for what happens when the health drops to zero. I'll use that as a good opportunity to give you guys some homework. You see, I don't want you to get stuck in a tutorial hell. So from now on, I'll give you an exercise at the end of each tutorial to experiment and figure things out yourself. Trust me, I learned everything the same way. All right, I want you to add a game over screen to the project. Remember, there is no one true way to achieve this. You can code the logic for game over in a bunch of different ways. So take time, make your game over screen and record it, screenshot it, whatever, and share it with me on any of my socials. In the next tutorial, I'll show you my implementation of the same, and maybe we can learn from each other. Lastly, you can find the links to the project in the description. All right, that's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned something from it. Don't shy away from reaching me out in the comments or my socials if you have any doubts, questions, or issues. I'm more than happy to help you out. Lastly, Remember, the best way to hurt a player is through silence.